Hello everybody. This is an interview with Putnam, the second programmer on Dwarf Fortress. For those of you who are unaware, she was hired shortly after the game released on Steam. She was already quite well known within the Dwarf Fortress community for finding bugs by reverse engineering the game, so she was already quite familiar with Dwarf Fortress and its inner workings, without ever actually seeing the code. Within months of launch, Putnam was instrumental in some of the biggest performance increases that the game has ever had, including changing the line of sight code and adding some minor multi-threading, and helping port the game from SDL to SDL2. But I'll let her explain that a little bit more. If you're looking for a particular topic, I've equipped this video with timestamps, so you can check those down in the description of the video or along the timecode. If you would like a full version of this interview without any cuts, aside from the obvious ums and uhs and blanks of silence, you can find that on my blog. I'll leave a link to that in the description of the video as well. But I think it's time for Putnam to take over. So, if you could introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about what you've been working on, I think that would be a good place to start this interview. I'm Putnam, I'm a programmer. I know that's a really general thing. I'm, I'm just sort of a programmer factotum, I guess. Well, it's been two and a half years, and I'd say primarily it's modernization, in a sense. And it's not like the code necessarily needs modernizing. Like, I'm not fixing anything that works, if you get me. But there are parts, like the graphics engine was on SDL1 and wasn't using graphics cards at all, and so on large displays it was just not running, so that needed updating. There's no multi-threading anywhere, so I found some places to add some. Also, just going back and like cleaning up the UI oddities that people find. But that hasn't been happening nearly as much for the last year or so, and I'm kind of hoping I can pick that back up soon, too. So Dwarf Fortress has always had a very simple RAWs format, and because of this, the capabilities of user modding is pretty limited on a vanilla state. The reason for these limitations is you only have the basic tokens that the game already understands, making it very difficult for a third party or a modder to add complex different behaviors to a new creature or entity. And many other portions of the game, such as its world generation, randomly generated items and monsters, randomly generated metals, are all hidden within the game's black box that have never really been exposed. And while there are ways of jury-rigging the game into doing things you want it to do, the modders have always been very limited, unless you're using something like DF Hack to edit the game in real time and inject extra code into it. The main topic of this video and the first thing that I ask Putnam about is Lua, because I wanted to know exactly how long she's been working on it and when the idea came about, because Tarn Adams has been talking about raw format changes for Dwarf Fortress for a very long time now, specifically relating to myths and magic. It will also be a huge boon to any modders. While only portions of the game are currently exposed using Lua, as we will discuss, it's already going to allow for a large variety of mods that the community has never seen before. So I was curious when the topic came up between Putnam and Tarn, and how long she'd been working on it. So the really funny, I don't remember the exact, maybe I can find just a bit over a year ago, just sort of asked, uh, can we start, we should, we should move to adding scripting for myths and magic, and I just sort of decided arbitrarily on the spot, well, it was at what everyone's familiar with and is easy to embed, so we're probably going to get that. I'm going to do basic Lua scripting for the procedural objects to see how well we can embed it into the game, and uh, that, that, was, that was really it. He, I was just asked to do it, <laughs> to add scripting. At the time of recording, the only things available to be modded with Lewis scripting are the procedural creatures and items. This means the night creatures, vampires, were creatures, forgotten beasts, etc., along with weather events. So on this subject, why were these entities selected as things that could be modified? Were these simply things that were easily accessible, or did it just seem like a convenient theme to stick with? It's essentially both. Uh, the procedural creatures were basically the first thing I was actually asked to do, because that's all, you know, myths and magic is all about generating procedural objects like that. But uh, there's obviously more that should be done within the basic start that we've got here is just like make sure we have working code that's embedded in the game and it in the future there will be a lot it'll it'll probably be a lot more uh, expressive able to do more things with the game itself the initial idea was actually the procedural stuff in so that we can add more procedural stuff later via lua like to make much of the world much of the initial uh myths gener myth generation scripted and you can sort of already do a whole myth generation with the system as it is so that's working pretty well actually what parts of the game does it currently touch if we could be specific uh you can check a lot of the world but not like a lot of the world state but not all of it it turns out i just sort of missed adding like entity information to it 
but entity information really is a lot, so it's not too surprising, and none of the procedural code actually uses it. I tried to expose things that the procedural code uses and not much more because, again, it's... Well, okay, because C++ has no reflection, so it's a very tedious process to get these things exposed to Lua in the first place. But now, something is out, so all that can be added in the future, and what it actually touches right now is just procedural objects. Uh, you can define raws and load them into the game as if they were part of a mod, and that sounds like a little basic, but the procedural generation really does add a lot to it. Like the example mod I had was making an alloy of adamantine with every single other metal in the game, and it can like it doesn't check for hard-coded metals it just goes through every metal and any modded metals it'll make an alloy of adamantine modded metals that sort of thing is possible now that wasn't really possible before during the conversation i quickly became curious what were some issues that they ran into during development for those of you who didn't know or maybe missed it these changes have been slowly chugging along in the experimental branch for dwarf fortress meaning anybody could theoretically opt in if they wanted to while this was announced pretty quietly by kit fox and bay 12 directly the majority of the player base was probably largely unaware so i had to ask whether or not any issues or problems arose during the development of these pretty seismic changes to dwarf fortress's code it was a double experimental it was also i i, I had also reworked the games like aged a uh, file loading system that I kind of suspected was causing problems with like people would go to their you know fortress sites and it just wouldn't be there because the site failed to copy over so the like save was just totally whack that way and I suspected that was due to like a OS or permissions issue or something so I just rewrote everything to be more proper in that way uh, to use the folder the operating system actually expects you to use saves for, at least as of now. I see people talking about it like it's some sort of DRM thing. I tried to find every issue and crash and weirdness with, with like switching between portable mode and not and all that sorts of things, but it turns out people do completely unsanctioned things to their operating system, so that's been a bit of a <laughs> headache to figure out. But it should be figured out. And, like, in the Lua experimental, mostly it's been, like, just yesterday I found an issue where uh, attack tweaks aren't being applied to Forgotten Beasts, so your Forgotten Beasts are actually nerfed pretty badly. Because the pick random conditional function I wrote was returning nil, and I was doing a nil check, like, wrapped around the error, which I should not be doing. Uh, I should have had an error if it was nil, but also sometimes it can be nil without being a problem, so I guess I shouldn't, and it's that sort of big problem. The attack tweaks issue was also why all angels just say it is a divine being, so I fixed both of those at the same time, which is nice. <laughs> it, it's that sort of thing that's like, like if I see a forgotten beast that says beware its webs in legends mode or whatever, I am not able to tell that it doesn't actually have webs unless it's some, unless I manage to get it to spawn in game or I like comb through the like debugging stuff to find that its raws do not contain webs so yeah now they have webs and things again sorry or they will so is that currently in the live build then uh yes for 51.01 and 51.02 uh worlds generated will have Highly nerfed Forgotten Beasts. When the patch for this rolls out, will Forgotten Beasts have their abilities again? Or is this something that re will require a new, like, world gen? I'm pretty sure it'll be a new world gen. I, I, like, there might be a way to migrate it backwards, but it's not, not really. Uh, like, I'd have to read the description and look for specific strings and, like, work backwards from there. Because that's the only really extant evidence of it. So yeah, that kind of mess up is, like, embarrassing <laughs> but it's uh you know you can't just pretend it didn't happen you gotta put it in the patch notes and fix it and of course you know when things like dwarf fortress are developed small changes to the code base can make pretty
pretty massive shifts to the game itself, causing ripple effects that often aren't seen until the wider audience gets their hands on them, like we just discussed. The Forgotten Beasts are particularly jarring, and I've seen reports of them acting very strange in the game from various discords. But of course, every plan starts with a step one, and then moves into step two, so I was curious as to what Putnam was hoping to work on next in regards to the Lua expansion. The next steps would be like allowing Lua to be like run from interactions and do things and other such things. You know, the obvious first thing people think of when they hear Lua is inc actually incorporating logic into modding stuff, and that's obviously desired. Generating gods and things, pantheons, that's a, an obvious good thing to have for myths and magic, and that's something else that needs that should be incorporated into it. Like all that sort of thing. Uh, just, just, just really expanding how much role it has, though. Hopefully not enough that it causes performance issues. I really doubt it will, though. Well, unless someone does something really bad in the Lua, or we're doing some horrible unsanctioned thing like calling Lua every time any unit sees another unit, oh no, it's line of sight again. <laughs> if it's in the format of mods, that's kind of do at your own risk, but that's definitely something that should be avoided in vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, none of that. The, the Lua is a bit risky. I removed all the obvious risk stuff, but like, I think the worst that you can do is crash the game, which mods could already do that. They shouldn't be able to, but like with Lua now, we have, we have new crashes that aren't our fault. <laughs> And, like, it's the same with DF hack. And, like, like with, with mods, crashes are generally our fault. We want to fix them with the raw mods. But with Lua mods, you never... You don't know. You have to look at it and determine if it's actually our fault. Sometimes, like, uh, one of the earliest uh, crashes that was found with the Lua modding was actually sort of our fault, but I don't know if I can really call it that. It was a heap smash caused by essentially every, like, tick this mod was generating 10 human civilizations and registering them. So there would be literal hundreds by the time World Gen was like a year in, and it was like recursive essentially because they wanted to generate instruments, and asking to generate the instruments would generate more civilizations. And it was, it was horrible. And, and that would cause a crash because eventually the languages would start getting overwritten by garbage data and I don't know why that would happen, that is definitely bad. Trying to follow it is extremely difficult. So instead I just added a helper table to uh, make sure you don't have to do the bookkeeping yourself on whether you're only doing the <laughs> doing your generation once. I wanted to push the conversation a little further and see exactly what the vision was for the end goals of the raw rewrite. How much access do they want us to have, and how far are they going to go with converting portions of the game into player accessible moddable files? So I had to ask, what was the end game? The raws should stay and be as easily moddable, and essentially myths and magic should be well not just bits and magic should be in lua there should be a if, if you have an interaction effect you have in mind but it doesn't exist uh lua should be able to do, like this is end game stuff lua should be able to do that i say end game but like kind of hoping to get all this in obviously i want it in as soon as possible but also you know <laughs> as soon as possible it could be a long time uh ui uh modification with lua is actually a very important thing for me uh it would allow for much faster patching of the UI stuff. Like, if I find a UI issue, I could just throw together a patch so I could use the experimental branch to have it, like UI updates or whatever for people to play around with. You know, that sort of thing, so we can set up patch notes for over time. Like, there's a lot that I really want the Lua to be, inevitably. And for people to be able to mod uh, the UI and, like, move it around and arrange it and make it better as they see fit and put UI mods in the workshops and things, and obviously keyboard support would. As I said, whenever I like look at a UI and rework it, I add keyboard support as I go, so this would be the same sort of thing. And the keyboard support is first class in the UI widgets that I'm planning to make Lua anyway, so that's a real goal, and I know it's a definite, it's a huge, it's a tiny minority, I'd say, but not an unimportant minority that like thinks keyboard support is the 
like total keyboard support is the deal breaker. But I do think they have a point, and it's a good point, and I am listening to them. Like, I think Adventure Mode is a lot, is a bit better about it. I think there's still one or two places that could do better with it, but it is better about it. I'm being crazy, but like, I was already, like, like the, the thing is, I've already been working on, like, next steps for Lua for months now. Like, while the experimental was running, I was doing the next steps to... And I could sort of... I mean, I could talk about that because, like, I don't know, that just seems like good practice to me. <laughs> to be, like, continuing further development while also maintaining all the development. That's what version control is for. That's what we got it for. And, like, what I'm excited for is the UI thing, mostly. Like, I really want that to be all together and... Like, for the game's UI to be very customizable. Like, that's one of the... Like, I think it was one of the eternal suggestions on the, like, Bay 12... On the Bay 12 forums, the eternal suggestion voting that from, like, yeah, from 2008. And, like, some of the suggestions were wrong in a really funny way. But I do remember, like, the top suggestion was better pathfinding code, even though pathfinding was not the speed issue. Or maybe it was in 2008. The game was slower back then. And, like, one of the top suggestions was, like, a fully modular, moddable UI so the community can handle, can, can do all that themselves. And I think that is a good thing to have. So I'm, I'm excited for the idea of that. Uh, and, of course, <laughs> someone... Someone in the comments, cut this out. He's gonna, <laughs> sorry, he's gonna say, oh, of course the devs are relying on the community, but the actual thought in my head is mostly, everyone's got their own idea of what like the ideal UI would look like. Like, I'm thinking of that Ross Scott video, the GUI could be better, much better, and it's over an hour long, and he has a bunch of good complaints about how, about the UI, and then his UI is like almost as bad. Like, that's what, that's what I'm thinking about. I think that sort of thing is why you want customizability in UIs, because some people do want a UI that's, like, just completely insane by your standards. At this point, the conversation was kind of winding down. There wasn't too much more that could be said, at least not publicly, and I felt that it was time to bring this conversation to a close. I think it's really interesting hearing a developer talk about their approach to user feedback as well as making things more accessible for a wider audience, which is of course an ongoing challenge when it comes to games like this, where obtuseness is the main form of marketing for it, and difficulty to get into for a long time was insurmountable for many. But I think that the game has come a long way, and I think that slow and steady improvements and listening to feedback are the only ways that you can continuously improve that in the long haul. And of course, if you yourself find an issue with the game or something that you dislike or would like to leave feedback for it, the KitFox Discord is the best place to do that, as Putnam confirms. Yeah, please do. We've got like a hundred times as many people are on the normal branch as on the beta branch, so we were expecting some issues with the... It's been less bad than I expected, which is good, but like someone is in the bug discussion forum right now with a... Uh, I have to... I'm bad at counting. Nine? Identical crashes, yes. I do look at these things and like write down, okay, this is a problem with doing live debugging with a... Uh, oh. That's new. <laughs> That's, oh wait, no, I'm in 52.01. But yeah, I don't need to... It should be good. Hi everybody, you made it to the end. I just want to say a thank you for watching these videos. These are some of the weirder things that I do and are a little bit harder to get into for a more casual audience, so I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to watch. I would also like to state that I'm sorry about the audio issues on Putnam's mic. I'm not entirely sure what was going on there. It almost sounded like it wasn't fully connected. I didn't hear anything until I was editing the audio and looking at the waveforms and I was just kind of stumped on how to fix it. I did my best to remove any egregious noise, but there's kind of that buzzing the whole time. That being said, if you would like the unedited version of this, there is a link to that on my blog in the description of this video, and any redactions are made purely due to audio issues, so just keep that in mind. The last thing I would like to add is thank you very much for watching. If you would like to help out this video, leave a comment underneath it, as I've kind of asked before. And also, of course, there's that like button, which is very important, which I am terribly awful at actually telling people to click on. If you haven't yet, 
do check out this YouTube channel. I cover a lot of things related to Dwarf Fortress and sometimes other things that I'm interested in. If you want to see me live, you can find me at B-L-I-N-D-I-R-L on Twitch, or you can find me here on this YouTube channel streaming. Although, if you want faster chat responses, I recommend tuning into the Twitch side. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.